Mm. I know, I know. Okay. <coughs> All right, so this way. Uh, all right, there we go. All right, good afternoon. Welcome to Raising Strong Will Kids Summit. My name is Andrea Miliani, and I'm your host today. And today we have Melissa Biancini, and we are going to talk about with well, Melissa how to how do processing issues impact self esteem and confidence in kids. Yeah, and a little bit about. Melissa, we uh, Melissa is a licensed clinical social worker with children and families is her specialty. She received her master's degree in social work from Fordham University, a bachelor's of science in psychology from Fordham University, and has done postgraduate work at Arizona State State University in neuroscience at anatomy and physiology. As a social worker, Melissa has extensive experience in the fields of neuro neurological processing, sensory integration, children and families, mental health, and addiction therapies. Melissa has specialized in sensory integration at the education as an educational director of a sensory integration clinic in Arizona, and now at the as executive director here in New York at Sensory Stepping Stones. She is dedicated to helping children, teens, and adults with executive function issues, autism spectrum disorders, traumatic brain injuries, sensory processing disorders, developmental disorders, attention deficit, and developmental delays and physical disabilities. So I'm gonna let <laughs> Melissa tell you yeah. any more. She has a long thing, but very accomplished. So I love it. Thanks, Melissa. You're welcome. Thank you for that introduction. Anything would you would like to add that I left off? Oh no, you got it all. <laughs> I want to make sure that because it was a long one and you have some really great, so it's really great. So today we're going to talk about, like I said, process, how do processing issues impact self-esteem and confidence in our kids? Um, so, so, all right, so that would be basically how do they, like that's a great first question. <laughs> so. <laughs> A lot of the times, as and even as adults, we know if we're not processing the information we're getting quickly enough or adequately enough, um, if we're not responding fast enough to the information, maybe we get tongue-tied. And so as over time, if we know that we're not keeping up with everybody else around us, we start second guessing ourselves. We start thinking that something's wrong with us. Uh, what's wrong with me? And that's where it starts to spiral. And that, that negative talk, the self doubt, um, once they start to see that everybody else is excelling and they're not, or just because they're doing it differently and they may take a little bit longer to do something that it just, it, it starts to impact how they believe that they are themselves, their self-esteem, their confidence. And we see that a lot with the boys, um, especially younger, because they're starting to do athletics and all the boys are doing that. Um, with COVID, it's been a little different um, because everybody's on games and doing everything virtually. And it's a little bit easier for people to be a little bit more interactive vers virtually than in person doing soccer in person. Um, yeah, how is that with the COVID? How are parents handling that? I mean, you know... It's tough because I'm seeing a lot of kids now as we're starting to come out of this. And I, I mean, I'm seeing it here at our clinic in, in New York, the mental health of these kids is, it has taken a hit. And I think it's something we're going to have to work on every child. It doesn't matter that, well, my child's normal. Everything's great. What they've internalized as a trauma the past year plus, like we have, we don't know how it's affecting them and it's affecting their self-esteem um, because now they've missed a year of development and growth, a year of um, socializing, a year of, you know, doing all that stuff with peers. And now we're throwing them back into it, expecting them to pick right up where they were. Um, and a lot of them are struggling. I know it's really hard. I mean, even like, you know, my son was, I mean, he, now he dropped out of college and he's working. I mean, he's got a great job. He's working full time, but it's like, he, um, was struggling with the, with the online. Yeah. 
you know, yeah. even as a, you know, he's 20 years old, but he was just struggling yeah. so much with that. And, and it's, it's both ways. There are some that are excelling and it, this is the best thing that could have happened for them was to pull them out of the schools and then go online. And then there's others that are not. And again, there is no one size fits all. We no, because everything everybody is individually. Exactly. Everybody is definitely. I agree with that. Awesome. That's great. Now, how do, they, how do these process issues impact self-esteem and comments? How, how will they, how do they actually like, so they start pulling away. Like You'll really see impact that, it. Yeah, they'll Let's they'll start, start pulling away. They won't have as many friends, or their friends mm -hmm. will be like associates. Um, their academics could start to slip um, because right. they're processing slowly. Maybe they're not keeping up with what the teacher's saying, and they have to write things down, um, or they're not able to tune out distracting sounds either in the classroom or Zoom. If they're doing their their Google Meets and their Zoom Meets, and you know their brothers in the other room crying, they might not be able to tune that out because their auditory system's not processing right, and so their academics start to struggle, um, and then they start to you know go downhill very quickly. You know, stressful life events can also impact that. So all of the way they process, they're just it starts to impact everything about what they're doing right. and how fast they're able to kind of recover from it. And so after a while, they just start to say, you know what, we're not, we can't do it anymore. You know, and like I said, the self-doubt comes into play. The negative talk comes into play. What, what would you say, like, what's a good way that parents can help the kids to like get through this? Maybe with the teachers, especially with the online now and, you know, to help them to like really, you know, to like, stay like focus and to really um you know understand to help them better with their own self-esteem so a lot of it is and i always say to the parents is is really finding out how they're processing their information so are they having auditory issues visual issues vestibular issues can they keep their body proprioceptive wife in time and space sitting in a chair or are they constantly bouncing <laughs> do they constantly need to move? Um, and a lot of the kids that I see, it's overlap with that ADD, ADHD component, um, whether they're, you know, given that diagnosis, given a medication, but then they're still not getting their academics up. And typically that's because they're not processing the information. So I can sit still because now I have a medication, but if I'm not understanding what's being said, if I'm not understanding what's up on the board or in front of me when I read or when I'm trying to do the math problems, it's not getting in, I'm not processing it. So the biggest thing a parent can do is to really figure out, are they struggling with processing issues? Um, and there's some places that will do it. I know we here do a, a completely different type of an evaluation to mm -hmm. see, to pinpoint what type of a processing issue they may be having. Auditory, visual, mm -hmm. vestibular, um, proprioceptive, gustatory, olfactory. We look at every single area. Your neuropsychs will look at some of those areas. If you go specifically to an audiologist, they'll look at some of those areas. Developmental optometrists will. So you can go to specific individual people to find out if your child is having a processing issue. Um, most of the time, those professionals are looking at processing delays or disorders. And there is a, a distinction. Uh, somebody can have a processing issue in auditory, meaning that they're not really getting everything that's being said. I always right. say back to the old Peanuts cartoon, if you think about the, the teacher in the background, wah, 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 wah. Oh, yeah. you're not the hearing famous, everything. Wah, wah, wah. Yep, but you, yeah. then you might hear chocolate. Oh, well, my son understood the word chocolate and came running, but didn't hear anything else. Um, they might not be able to pick up on that slight little not so it's a frequency that they're hearing just a little bit inaccurately. They're still hearing. So an audiologist would say, well, they have good processing, they're hearing, they're but they're hearing. not really they're getting not. all of the subtle pieces of it. So you really want to figure that out. Once you know if they're struggling in those areas, that's when I always say you develop coping strategies around them. So if you know they're having auditory sensitivities, maybe it's the soundproof headphones so that you, that the noise canceling headphones, 
while they're doing their work. Maybe it's making sure that they're in a room where the TV is not on so that there's no visual and, and auditory distractors going through that, that room. Um, you really try to give them better coping strategies and skills, small mm -hmm. bits of homework at a time instead of all of the homework thrown at them at once so that they're able to process things slowly at the rate that they can and then they can be successful. That's where we then build up that self-esteem and self-confidence that, oh, this was hard, but because it was smaller, I tried and I got it done. Um, the other thing you can do is, is if you're seeing that they're struggling, I always say, request accommodations, go and get them tested mm -hmm. for a 504, for an IEP, um, you know, add accommodations. If it's not working, you can call a meeting at any time during the year and say, this is not working. We need to kind of readdress what we're, what's going on. Um, and the biggest thing is adapting the environment. So if you know that they're working on their homework in their room is not working and they need to be in the kitchen, then so be it. Or vice versa. The kitchen is not the best place for them. It's too loud and it's the hub of the house. They need to go to their room. Um, so it's, it's just making small adjustments once you understand where your child is struggling. Interesting. You know, with the IEP, is, I was wondering with this whole thing that I mean, this past year that we've been going through and being online, is that a big, I mean, is that hard for the, mm -hmm. is it still kind of, it must be a tough thing. I mean, even with that line, is it still effective? So a lot of the accommodations, because they were all classroom based are very difficult. So what, that's one of the things that we do here is during our assessment, I'm able to not just give accommodations for in-person and classroom, but there are accommodations that can be made when they're doing their, their Google Meets. There are online accommodations. Unfortunately, really? no one was able to do it fast enough. Yeah. Um, and now we're all back laid and, and backlogged. And I know the school districts are having trouble even getting the normal regular triennials in and all of those meetings. But there are things that can be done. Um, instead of them doing everything online, it can be that they get stuff sent home, worksheets sent home and printed out so that they're doing it on paper and bringing the paper back in and sending it back in. Oh, awesome. That's, I know, because I know that's a big struggle. Yeah. And, yeah, but that's, I mean, that's, they just have to just kind of keep it going. Um, are, are there environmental factors that we should be aware of that could impact them as well? Like different so, environmental things that would like, or is it basically, um, you know, basically? Well, I mean, our biggest, like as far trauma. as like, <laughs> You know, well, right now is a trauma. So this trauma can definitely impact it. Stress, I'm you know, sure, all yeah. of that. Um, just like for us, when we're stressed out, when, when there's something else going okay. on that's not abnormal, we don't focus well. We are right. brain fogged. We, right. you know, things like that. Um, right. Of course, if they already have any other concurring issues or disorders going on at the same time, that's right. always going to play. Right. Um, you know, and again, if I don't have friends, my, my self-esteem and impact is going to go down. So, and right now I can't even see my friends, even if I do have friends, unless I'm online. Um, you know, if I know well, I'm that's struggling. gotta be a big thing. That's gotta be a big thing right now because yeah. you know, they, they've been going through this thing of not having friends and doing things or a birthday party on zoom, or, you know, it's like, you know, yeah. And even, even for some of the kids that are going and doing stuff and some, some of the families that have said, okay, we we feel like we're in a safe place that we are going to go out right. and adventure. There are a lot of other families that are because of maybe they have, you know, they're taking care of a grandparent or they have health concerns themselves that they can't allow their children to go back to school in person to go and do these other things. So of course that's going to take a hit on the self-esteem of that child too. Um, you know, their own issues, parents, if they have their own issues or mental illness in the family, you know, economic stressors are going to impact it because then the family's going to stress out, the kid's going to feel the stress and it just kind of trickles from there. Interesting. I mean, that's really interesting. Um, like, okay, what, what can we do to help address the root cause of where this is coming? So again, As it's just finding out those things. It's really figuring out what's going on for that child, where mm -hmm. that issue lies under it, how a parent can actually help it. Um, there are professionals out there that can help it. So if the schools aren't able to, or, you know, you're given the, well, we're going to push it, you know, we have the 60 days to test, right. um, you know, like they do, 
in that time frame, if you're able to get them involved in, you know, even small groups or outside PT, OT, speech, and academic stuff, anything that can help address some of the way that they're processing information, right. even just somebody else presenting information to you in a different way, you understand it. Right. And pro like, like, even like with, if they're seeing a psychiatrist or a neurologist, mm -hmm. oh, or, yes. um, and also therapy, like, or what is that cognitive behavioral therapy? Is so there's that CBT therapy, therapy DBT. Um, it can be even just as simple as a social skills group. Um, some of the kids, and we run a lot of them here, and our, of course our anxiety ones have been packed. But oh, really? um, yeah, I mean, just having a, a small group of other individuals that you don't know from school, maybe two or three others, that you can understand that they're going through the same thing, so you're not alone. Um, there are others feeling that way. So it's sometimes what kind of what kind of ages like for groups like that, or does it matter? Or do you have different age groups? Or? Personally, here at the clinic, we have we run groups for little ones. So once they're in kindergarten, we have groups that go from kindergarten all the way up through high school. Um, mm -hmm. But again, where you're living, where where you're at, you can easily Google and find out if there are social skills groups. Some of them are meeting online. Um, here at the facility, we do everything in person. Um, I'm a believer that as long as we're staying safe and staying you know, within the six feet and cleaning everything, these kids need in-person services. Um, right. it's, it's and tough. You guys go, so you guys go up to like high school or like 18, 19? Or... So my, my groups, my social yeah. skills groups are going up to the high school level, um, but all of our other therapies that we address here 93 is the oldest I've treated. So there's, your brain is never too old to Ooh. rewire and get shifted, so. All right, that's good to know. Yeah. That's <laughs> awesome, I, I mean, yeah, okay, yeah, no, I guess we all, I mean, I have, my son is 20 and he's he's got, a, he was diagnosed when he's seven and my daughter has anxiety and depression, she's 24 okay. and sensory, a lot of sensory, noises bother, she uses her headsets for a lot. Yeah. So, and yeah. we don't know, we don't oh, always outgrow it. It, it shifts. Yeah, it yeah. shifts. So again, as an adult, you can, we can say, okay, well, that place is too loud and noisy. I'm just not going to go there for a seven or eight year old. Guess what? At school, it doesn't matter if it's too noisy, you have to go, <laughs> you know, so they don't yeah. have a choice. Exactly. So, so they just have to, that's really good. What would you say, Melissa, like, what would you want people listening to take away from all this that could you know their biggest takeaway that they should basically you know i always say that it, it comes to what's going on for every individual so every individual is different every regardless of a diagnosis regardless of symptoms and that mm -hmm. we really have to figure out what's going on for that one person how they're interacting in their world and how their world is interacting on them because regardless of of what we're seeing, whether it's, you know, their processing issues, their self-esteem, their, um, you know, they can have anger issues or depression or anxiety. There's a reason why. And we really have to just peel those layers of the onion back and figure out what truly caused it and where is that snowballing from and get to it because we can address it if, if we just take the time and, and do a little extra work. That, that makes sense. That makes sense. Definitely. Definitely. I like that. Um, now, I think you also have like a free gift or something that for the viewers. Did yeah, you so I do. In? I'm going to have free consultations. They can mm -hmm. email me um, awesome. or they can log in and, and see if they would like to have a free one-on-one -on -one consultation. I okay. do that with um, families that are here locally if they want to come in, but I'm extending it. So I will talk about anybody's 504 IEP, any issues they're having or concerns that they're having that they're not getting anything addressed the way they want. Um, right. That's one of the services that we do offer here as well, but I'm willing to do it with your, your viewers for um, a consultation, free consultation. That would be great. That's awesome. That would really help it. So you like when you would work with the, you would help the families, like the moms, and you also work with the kids as well. Yes, right? we work with everybody. So there's okay. a lot, several, several of my staff here have specialties. Um, so it could be whether it's organizational, it could be parenting, it could be, you know, working individually. Siblings, maybe sometimes a sibling. Yep. You know, you we got do, one that's neurotypical and then the other one, yeah. you know, and just to help them better understand. Yep, we do that as well. Awesome, that's really great. Thank you, Melissa. You're welcome. Yeah, thank you for your time and great. and. 
you have a lovely day and thank you for your thank time. You. And I'm just going to put it definitely something everybody should grab and get a free consultation with you. Thank and you. you have a great one. Thank you so much. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye, Melissa.